Good morning. Let's turn to John chapter 20 and think about the first day in a new world and the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, we pray as we turn to your word that you may speak through it into our hearts, that we might hear your voice, that we might see you, and so live in that revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the text. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over. He looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight in to the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus's head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And what John does in chapter 20 and chapter 21 is bring forward a series of witnesses and they're different people with different personalities you can even see some of those personalities in this uh, the passage this the first passage that we will look at here so this is the first 10 verses and then the the point that he's getting to comes in verse 31 where he says these things are written so that you might believe and so there's a role of witnesses as he and he's inviting those who are reading this to take their place as members of that role of witnesses and it's in the, in the next section when he's encountering thomas and he says blessed are those who don't see and yet believe so we're brought into the story of the resurrection it's what we do so he's provided the information and then he's offering a challenge. And it's what we do with the information and the challenge that we receive. But this is where it begins. And the first witness is really Mary Magdalene. She's the first to the tomb early on the first day of the week. But you notice something very significant here. It's this point. While it was still dark. And that makes you think of something that John does constantly, and that is referencing that bipolarity between light and dark. Those who think they can see but can't see, you know, the blind, those born blind or the blind Pharisees and light coming into the darkness. So light meaning revelation, meaning knowledge. Oh, I see. I understand. And yet Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb in the dark and we still use this expression in english in as an Indi english uh, idiom when we say i'm in the dark he was in the dark about that and it means just means simply he didn't know he didn't know so mary magdalene doesn't know in fact she makes some wrong assumptions she goes to the tomb and she sees the stone had been removed from the entrance. She's on her own in this in this uh, version, in, in other synoptic versions. She's with other women. And she's on her own in her sorrow, I guess. And she sees the stone's been removed. She makes the assumption. And the assumption she makes is there's been a grave robbery. That's how we might understand they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. The body has been stolen. What, what's going on? That's her first assumption. So you might say, even though this is the first day, 
even though this is the first day in the rest of the world, <laughs> this is resurrection day, this is the day of something brand new beginning, she's still operating from old world assumptions. It's a grave robbery. This is a calamity. Everything has gone wrong. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. And she tells her, her family members, I guess you, you might say, Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And that phrase there, the one Jesus loved, is one of the guys on the role of witnesses and he's going to become more and more important. And of course, that's the author of John's gospel himself. This is how he is referenced here, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it's a necessary humility. Otherwise, he might dominate the proceedings, you know, from a literary point of view, he might dominate it by his own. I was there and, and then I saw this and then I saw that. And then so he's he's distancing himself from the immediacy of the action. So I think it's a necessary humility, but it's also a claim. It's a claim, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's a massive claim, isn't it? And then, of course, in the account of the in John chapter 13, he's resting on Jesus's shoulder. He sort of positioned himself as a close, intimate confidant of Jesus, like the inner circle of the disciples. So this is uh, John. John. So it's Peter and John. And then there's this beautiful character note. And I think that I think that the Holy Spirit wants us to notice this, that there are there are three characters here and they're all going to be confronted with the resurrection of Jesus. And they're going to come to understand, but not straight away. Remember that this is impossible, right? Remember that this is just astonishing. This is unbelievably strange. And these three characters are going to come and receive the information and then make their assessment of what they've seen and witnessed. And then they're going to respond with their lives. So this is a this is the challenge that this text brings us, because this is what we're called to do to receive the information to look at it, to consider it, to even express doubts and confusion and fear, and then to make a decision. And the decision is going to change everything. So it's the first day of the week, and it's still dark. The decision is pending, you might say. So here's the character. Here's the Peter and John and we've seen these guys before they are archi <laughs> they're typical typical disciples and Peter particularly has almost got everything wrong that he could have got wrong and just the day before well a couple of days before he has denied Jesus and run for his life and and when the crucifixion happens he is nowhere to be seen John has been um near the cross near with the family of jesus you might say he's remained intimate and close so peter big bolshe and, and john uh, faster faster on his feet and faster on his uptake so peter and the other disciple start for the tomb both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. It's like, I have to get to the point. I have to find where Jesus is. I have to sort this out. They run for the tomb and one goes faster than the other. And he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen, but he doesn't go in. Why not? So this is the character note. He's beginning to consider so Mary makes the assumption that Jesus's body has been stolen. She she's just sees it from one perspective. John stands at the edge and looks and considers. He sees strips of linen. The body's been taken out of the linen. Then Simon Peter comes behind him and goes straight in. And isn't that just what Peter did 
right the way through the Synoptic Gospels. And it? it's such a strong character note, just stepping in where angels fear to tread, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, blurting. Do you have a problem with blurting? Well, we're in good company. Amen. <laughs> and Peter goes straight in, straight in. He sees, he sees, he sees the strips of linen. He sees the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still in its place as if Jesus had risen through them. The cloth is separate from the linen. You've got a sort of a head thing and a, and a body thing. And then the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. So he's a little bit more, you might say he's more decorous, more gentle in his approach. Peter is more impulsive and strident. He goes in, but neither of them get the full picture because of what happens next. It says the other disciple, he saw and believed. What did he believe? What did he believe? He, he, he didn't believe what Mary Magdalene had told them. He believed something else. He was feeling his way towards something, something else. But we know that he wasn't quite there yet because verse 9 says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. It's like the Scripture means the Old Testament, means the Hebrew Bible. And they had intimations of 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 what was happening in the Old Testament. They were like dots, but they hadn't connected the dots up, the ancient promises with the contemporary events. They hadn't drawn the line. They hadn't made the connection that the Messiah must suffer. Remember the resistance that Jesus had when he said, yes, I am the Messiah, and the Messiah must suffer many things and be rejected. And on the third day, he will rise again. When Peter heard that, he didn't get to the rise again bit. He was still busy uh, dissing <laughs> the bit that came before. No, 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 no. Not on my watch. You will, you know, this will not happen to you. And they had a wrong perception of Messiah. So they had a wrong perception or an inadequate perception of what the Old Testament taught, what the Hebrew Bible taught about Messiah. They only had half a picture, a kind of nationalistic type of picture. They didn't understand. So we have these words, and John uses them all the time, the word see and saw. Remember he said with Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. And then he said, come and see. And then Nathaniel comes and then he says, and you will see. So it's all a matter of perception and understanding. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying, which is a rather <laughs> sort of slowing down the action a little bit, isn't it? OK, so here's some moments from the first day. Still dark. The stone has been removed. Something has changed. We don't know. We don't know who's taking the body. We don't know what's going. We don't see it. We don't see it. It's still dark. It's still dark. They, they start for the tomb. You have to Go to the information. You have to find it for yourself. You have to actually go inside, go inside. And he saw and believed, this is John, but they still did not understand. And this is where we're brought. This is day one, day one. This is where we begin. And God calls us in our darkness into something that is extraordinary that if we make this step, if we go to the tomb, if we find it empty, if we go on inside, then we make the assessment for ourselves. What what it was what's happening? What's happening? I have to know. I have to see for myself. Amen. I have to receive this information. So, but well, this does not happen. This is impossible. This cannot be. They must have stolen his body. I must have. I, they see the strips of linen. They see the headpiece. What? What? And once they made the decision, which we'll be thinking our way through this coming week, and all the role of witnesses, we have to take time with this and think about it. 
we have to put ourselves in the picture and say, what do I do with this? Because for these guys, it meant their lives, their literal lives. And it means no less for us. Because if this is true, if Christ is risen, as Paul said, then everything changes. Everything changes. Lord, we pray as we consider this word, that you will speak it into our hearts, that we will hear and see and believe and live our lives in the revelation of that sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.